Thank you for that. My name is Mike Martin, and I am the pastor here at Redemption City Church. So if you're new, uh, thanks so much for coming out. We're so glad you could join us here in the middle of this beautiful summer. We are actually in a series, a new series that we've been working on throughout the summer called Finding Your Place in God's Story. So we're actually doing an overview of the entire Bible. And so we're just kind of blazing our way through here through some very large chunks of of scripture, so I will get you up to speed, and then we'll uh, follow through uh, this morning. But uh, if you don't have a Bible handy, we'd love to just get one of those in your hand. You just slip your hand up, get some guys in the back, and they will just slip one of those little paperback Bibles into your hand. Uh, we got some of the stuff up on the screen there, but um, I'd love to get you a Bible in your hand. If you don't have one, it's free for you to keep and uh, take uh, our gift to you. And so, um, just to get you up to speed so far here, we've been following along with the story here. We, we started all the way back in Genesis, uh, chapter 315, we looked at God creating the world, right? man rebels against God and falls into sin, and what we're tracking with then is God's story of redemption as it unfolds throughout the Bible, God's plan to rescue his people and bring them back into a relationship with him, and ultimately to restore the entire world to, to its original design that God had for it. So what we saw back in Genesis chapter 3, 15, is that there's going to be a champion and it's going to defeat the forces of evil. It's going to be a child of the woman, child of Eve, that's going to come and conquer evil once and for all. We saw second with Abraham in his life in Genesis chapter 12 that God was going to bless all the families of the earth through Abraham. And so the Bible is a story of uh, the conquest of evil. It's a story of God's blessings going forth to the nations. We saw in the book of Exodus that the Bible is a story of redemption, right? God frees his people from slavery in Egypt so that they can follow him, so that they can live for him. And then last week, we saw kind of all of those themes kind of come together and, and they climax in the kingdom. God brings his people out of Egypt, he brings them into the land, and he sets a king over them who is going to display God's wisdom to the nations. What we saw is that people are coming from all over the world then to hear the wisdom of God. The Queen of Sheba comes from all the way down in Africa and comes up to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And it seems like God is about to fulfill his promises of bringing his hope and his peace to the world. It's a high point in Israel's history, and, and this week, um, things take a turn for the worse. We're going to follow the tragic fall of the kingdom of Israel and the hope that God's prophets offer to his people. So, so if you're coming this morning and you're disillusioned by the disappointments in your life, reading through the prophets is for you. They give just a great commentary on what it looks like to live in a fallen world and God's promises seem to have been forfeited. If you are sick of the status quo, religious rituals, hypocrisy, people just going through the motions, people just phoning it in, kind of doing the typical West Michigan kind of religious thing, well, the prophets are once again for you. And finally, if you are looking for some hope this morning, and I mean like God-sized hope in what God, who God is, what he's doing in the world, the prophets are definitely for you. You're going to find some incredible hope here in the prophets as we read. And what I want to start um, this morning is actually in Isaiah chapter 11. It's been kind of a, a lightning rod, if you will, as I've been studying through the prophets to see who God is and what he's doing. And so we're going to start in Isaiah chapter 11. I think the page number there is page 370. Um, those little ESV paperback Bibles. Isaiah chapter 11, we'll read this uh, passage of scripture and then we'll pray and we'll get to work <clears throat> this morning. So, Isaiah chapter 11, starting in verse 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge 
and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fatted calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, and their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. It shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Let's pray this morning that God would open, us, open our eyes to his hope for us um, in his word. Father, we long for the day when the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea when every person has tasted and seen that you are good, when harmony is restored between God and his people in the world. Father, would this hope burn in our hearts uh, this morning, would this hope radically change the way we relate to the world around us, even this morning? And so would you come with the power of your Holy Spirit, God, would you um, give us your hope this morning and send us out into the world with your spirit, helping to serve your people well this morning. We pray all in Jesus' name. Amen. So, goal for this morning is this. This is what I want you to see. We're, we're doing a series, Finding Your Place in God's Story. And what I want you to see is that people who find their place in in the story, will be not be content until the earth is filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And so as a people, the prophets are casting a vision for something a little bit bigger than just showing up to church and being good Christian people. What the prophets are casting a vision for is nothing less than the entire earth being filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover cover the sea, every person tasting and seeing that the Lord is good, every person entering into a relationship with the true God of the universe and experiencing what it is to know Him. And people who find their place in that story won't settle for anything less. If you're taking notes, if you're looking for a little outline, I've got three points this morning. I'm going to look at the fall of the kingdom. We're going to kind of do a real quick survey of First and Second Kings. And then we're going to look at the judgment of the kingdom. We're going to be looking at Isaiah this morning, kind of as a representative sample of the prophets. And then we're going to be looking at the restoration of the kingdom also for us in Isaiah. So, so let's take a look here at the fall of the kingdom. Right? Last week, um, where we left God's people, they were kind of at the apex of the kingdom in the Old Testament. If you know anything about the Old Testament, right, they... People of Israel get into the land, you know, David comes along as a king, defeats all of God's enemies, and then his son Solomon sets on the throne, and Solomon, you know, builds up Jerusalem, he builds a temple for God, God comes and dwells in the midst of his people, and there's this incredible prosperity and wealth flooding into Israel, um, Solomon is gifted by God with just absolutely incredible wisdom and as we mentioned right you know people are streaming from all over the nations to hear about the wisdom of god it's it's this great high point in israel's history and, and the people there must have thought this is the time where god is going to spread his kingdom to the world people are going to experience the goodness of god from every nation and every people and every land those promises to abraham that god will bless all the families that, that are about to come true and we think that it's about to happen. And then the story takes a turn uh, for the worst. If you want to follow along, um, certainly don't have to. It would be in 1 Kings chapter 11. 
Or read what happened to Solomon, who had such promise, such a bright start to his reign in Israel, and it seems like everything's going forward. And then we read in 1 Kings 11, now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which the Lord said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. But Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives, and his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as with the heart of David his father. So Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. And Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites on the mountain east of Jerusalem, and so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrifices to their gods. And so, move over, Hugh Hefner, you know, the Playboy Mansion, you know, Solomon's got 700 wives and, and 300 girlfriends, essentially, you know, concubines were just kind of an added perk there um, for the king in those days when um, exploitation of women was systemic, pretty much in the culture, that was how it worked, I mean, it was a hard patriarchal society where, where men did what they pleased. It was not uh, a good time to be clearly a woman. And Solomon took advantage of that situation and he brought in women from all over the world to satisfy his, his sexual appetite. And those women subtly began to turn his heart away from the Lord. He begins to offer sacrifices to their gods, and, and the gods here, and we, we kind of are a bit distantly removed from, from ancient Canaanite religion, but what would have been involved with, with many of these religions would have been cultic shrine prostitution, child sacrifice, and, and just, just levels of immorality that would kind of blow our minds today as contemporary people. But Solomon begins to build temples for his wives that are coming from all these pagan nations around. He begins participating in their cultic ceremonies, and, and he is himself possibly offering his own children as sacrifices to pagan gods. The situation has rapidly deteriorated in the kingdom of Israel, which seemed as if it would be a beacon of hope to the nations. Now the nations have come in, and the syncretism has come together in Israel, and, and this shining beacon of hope that God is offering to the nations has been lost. It's been extinguished um, because Solomon put his hope right in these women and these relationships that he thought would do it for him. And later on in his memoirs in Ecclesiastes, he's going he's to kind of share that experience about none of it ever satisfied. It didn't provide meaning for him. It didn't ultimately work. But at this moment, it's, it's a sad moment in Israel's history as we're following the story. As we read on in verse 9, uh, the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord. The God of Israel would appear to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that they should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, since this has been your practice, you have not kept my covenant, and my statutes that I commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Yet for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it to your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son. For the sake of David, my servant, for the sake of Jerusalem, that I have chosen. And so what we see here is that God is bringing his judgment on the nation of Israel because of Solomon's sin. And it's really all downhill from here in the narrative, right? The kingdom reaches its apex with Solomon. It's, and it really is, it's just all downhill as you're reading. There's some exceptions to that. But by and large, you know, the history of Israel's kingdom from that point on is decline. And yet, in the midst of God's judgment, 
There's faithfulness we see in this text. God is not going to tear the whole kingdom away from David. He's going to preserve right, a son to give David a king, as we saw last week. God's promise to David that there will be a king that will reign forever on the throne of King David. And so when Solomon's son takes over, Rehoboam, he's a particularly foolish young man and thinks that Solomon was great. I'm far greater than Solomon. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dominate these tribes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring this powerhouse nation of Israel out. And we're going we're gonna to go out there and we're going to conquer the nations. We're, we're going to win fame and renown for ourselves. And the rest of the people of Israel, the ten tribes of the northern kingdom or the northern Israel, leave. They say, we're not serving this fool of a man. And, and they leave under the leadership of Jeroboam, a rival king. And, and uh, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, is left with two tribes in the southern kingdom called, uh, which is going to be called Judah. I think I have a map up here, actually, on the board of this split that happens between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. If you're looking in the green there, the territory that's in green is going to be the northern kingdom under King Jeroboam. And then the southern kingdom there in the purple is going to be the kingdom that's left to Rehoboam in the south. And so the kingdom is divided and it's all downhill from there. The northern kingdom is going to actually be deported to Assyria in 722 BC. From the start, the northern kingdom um, fell into apostasy, already similar to Solomon's, largely for political reasons. They didn't want the people of northern Israel to travel down to Jerusalem to the temple to worship, so they created their own um, golden calves and their own temples as alternative places of worship. And um, it wasn't long before syncretism crept in again, and the, the shrine prostitution and immorality and social injustice again began to uh, grow in the northern kingdom. And uh, it wouldn't be too long before God would send his judgment. And, and uh, King Shalmaneser of Assyria would come in and brutally conquer the northern kingdom, uproot them, and transplant them in Assyria and bring Assyrians back into the land. And so the land of northern Israel would be a land of, of kind of mixed descendants, half-breeds, and Samarian, Samaritans by Jesus Day. But the uh, southern kingdom was not far behind either. The southern kingdom uh, was also sent into exile, this time in the land of Babylon. The same problems haunted the uh, southern kingdom as haunted the northern kingdom. Syncretism emerged and the kind of pagan immorality that characterized the Canaanites again spread down to the southern kingdom. And so the immorality, the injustice, um, just grew to just epidemic levels, and God sends his people again, this time into exile. In 587 uh, BC, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, will come uh, to Jerusalem. He will destroy the city, he will burn the temple to the ground, and he will carry off all the goods in the temple. And the southern kingdom will go this time into exile because God is still going to remain faithful to his promises to David. Preserve a king who will bring his hope to the nations. And so, so this monarchy is going to be brought to exile in Babylon for 70 years. And then um, once the Babylonians are kind of swallowed up by the Persian Empire, King Cyrus, Persian king in 536, is going to bring them back to the land. And so they resettle in Jerusalem and they build the walls, in the book of Nehemiah, and they reestablish it. It looks like kingdom is going to return again. Jerusalem will rise from the ashes. And yet a king is not yet established. And then they build the temple and it looks like the glory of God will fall and will again be a beacon to the nations. And yet the glory never returns to the temple. They build it. We read actually in Ezra 3.12 that many of the priests and Levites and heads of the father's houses, the old men who had seen the first temple wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid, though many shouted for joy. As we get to the end of the narrative in the Old Testament, in Ezra and in Nehemiah, it's anticlimactic. It's as if, you know, the kingdom has fallen, and it's like God has brought his people back, and he's going to restore their fortunes, and yet the kingdom hasn't arrived. The glory hasn't returned to the temple, and we're still waiting for God to come and establish his kingdom in the world. Compared with the great days of King Solomon, the restoration was an enormous 
let down. They're awaiting a still greater restoration for God's people. So what's the point, you might ask, of all this uh, little history lesson that I've put together for you so far? You know, what are you actually going to take home from all this? What I want you to see is that even in the most disappointing and tragic circumstances, which here include almost 400 years of apostasy, 400 years of decline, 400 years of pagan nations coming in and conquering God's people and ruling over them. 400 years. What I want you to see is that God has not given up on his people. God has a purpose for his people and their pain and their suffering. And so if you are disillusioned by some of the disappointments in your life, it doesn't mean that God has abandoned you. It doesn't mean that you are alone this morning. In fact, what we're going to see is that God gives the most extraordinary promises anywhere in the Bible, right here in the prophets, as they're going to come and they're going to present God's hope to the people. Ari Clement says it well. I think I have his quote for you. Uh, on the screen so you can follow along. He says that the period of history which saw the golden age of the prophets had its, at its center the immediate crisis of the exile which placed in jeopardy the entire life and faith of Israel. The prophetic interpretation of this disaster and the promise of a renewal of divine grace gave to Israel a spiritual insight which made, which made it possible to accept this defeat and suffering as the will of Yahweh and rise from it purified and spiritually strengthened. So if you are looking for hope this morning, if you're looking for encouragement in the midst of disillusionment, disappointment, the prophets are for you because they present incredible hope in the midst of a backdrop of despair and disillusionment for God's people. And so the question that the prophets are wrestling with is, is what happened to all God's promises to Israel? Right? We, we've been going through this series, this champion will defeat evil, this blessings to the nation, redemption from slavery, um, God's king bringing his wisdom to the nations. What happened? Have they been abandoned? What the prophets do is they explain that what is happening to Israel happens by God's direct purpose. God is bringing his judgment on the people he loves, and God is bringing his hope of restoration to uh, the people he loves. And so if you're, if you're fed up with hypocrisy and kind of fake, man-made, going through the motions sort of religion, you're going to appreciate the critique that the prophets bring this morning. See, Isaiah is going to start with a message of judgment to the southern kingdom in, in chapter 1, but he's going to go on to war in northern, the northern kingdom, Assyria, Babylon, Philistia, Moab, Damascus, Cush, Egypt, Tyre, Sidon, and ultimately he's going to present a message of judgment to the entire world, and the indictment on the charges is this, they have failed to follow God's law, right, which could be summed up this way. Right? Deuteronomy 6, 5. Pull out the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Or in Leviticus 19, 80. Love your neighbor as yourself. Right? And Israel is indicted for its failure to love God the way he has called them to love him. Israel is indicted for their failure to love their neighbor as themselves. And Isaiah is also going to call Israel for their failure to walk in God's wisdom. They failed to apply the law wisely to their culture. Isaiah 58 is one of those beautiful examples where Isaiah calls his people out from their religious rituals and their religious, um, their kind of dead religious practices, and he calls them to true spirituality, to what it looks like to really follow God. If you're in Isaiah 58, I want to read this for you. Cry aloud, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgressions, to the house of Jacob their sin. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask me, ask me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. They like to hang out and do church stuff. 
They ask, why have we fasted and you seen it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with wicked fists. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I, that I choose a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will this fast in a day be acceptable to the Lord? You think if you go through religious rituals, you think if you show up to church and you throw out religious cliches and expressions, you think that's going to impress me, the God of the universe? So he says, is this not the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you, and the glory of, the God, of God will be your rear guard. You see, the prophets, they are totally slamming Israel for being a people that should know better. They know they're called to love God. They know they're called to love, people, love other people, and they're called to apply that in the culture that God has put them in. In Israel, they're to be weakened to the nations of how good it is to live under the rule of King Jesus, and they have screwed it up radically. They've turned religion into just a little sphere of their lives that they do maybe on the Sabbath, and they go to the temple and do their ritualistic things, and then the rest of their lives are just characterized by injustice and immorality, and, and it's a mess, and Israel is just going to call them out on their hypocrisy. Saying, you know, all your religious rituals, right? You, you don't have true righteousness. And what the prophets are going to say is that God can't tolerate this kind of evil. What they go on to say is that God's judgments are actually an expression of his love. Right? God loves this world too much to let it be overrun by evil. And how could he not be angry when people he loves are being abused? How could he not be angry when the world he loves is being devastated by hate and injustice and sin? It would actually be the height of apathy and indifference for God to do nothing. And so God sends his judgment in the prophets or in throughout Israel's history, as we've seen, as a wake-up call to the people of Israel. C.S. Lewis says it like this, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our conscience, but he shouts to us in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. God sends judgment to his people to wake them up so they experience who he is. And we need that here, right? We live in what I love to call Jerusalem, right? You can go, you can buy the t-shirt actually, right? We're in the holy city here. You know, it's kind of the holy huddle. We got all these churches and denominations and religious affiliations and and a lot of people that are just going through the motions, that are just kind of phoning it in. And the prophets are saying to our city today, wake up, right? If you're really going to follow God, follow him with your whole heart. We need that. I talked to a guy this week, actually, and, and he's just like, I just got tired of going to church and being a hypocrite. And I'm like, man, I really, I really respect that in a sense, right? You can be honest enough to say, I'm not just going to go through the motions, I'm not just going to show up at church and, and pretend like everything's okay, right? I really, if I'm going to do this, it's going to have to be the real thing. Too often, religious culture like ours leads to irreligion, doesn't it? We tell people, go be a good person, go follow God, you know, go love God with your heart so much, right? love your neighbors, be a good guy, help everybody, you know, clean up tornado damage, do all this stuff, be a good person, and, and we realize at the end of the day that we can't do it, right? We, we can't even live up to our own standards, much less God's, right? We, we set goals, we set objectives for ourselves. You know, Benjamin Franklin was famous with this. He just set this example of how he was going to perfectly live this incredibly virtuous life, and, and, and none of us can manage even with our own little standards that we set out in front of us. So what hope is there, right? A bunch of dead religion, a bunch of irreligion, the prophets, all that stuff is just going to leave us demoralized and discouraged at the end of the day because there's no hope, there's no gospel. And that's what the prophets go on 
chapter after chapter after chapter to lay out the hope of God's king that is coming to save the world because at the end of the day it's not going to be our morality, our religious power, it's not going to be us pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps that's going to change even our hearts, much less our lives and our families and our communities and our world, it's going to be God acting decisively in our world and in our lives to empower us to be the people God is calling us to be. And so as we get into the prophets, you have to be prepared here for an incredible dose of hope that is coming. Already in Isaiah chapter 1, after a litany of Israel's sins, and they are not light, things like spiritually, God calling them essentially spiritual prostitutes, right? You, you, you've forsaken me, right, and followed other gods, you loved other things over me, and yet God can say right at the start here in verse 18, come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though you are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Already God is promising his people that he's going to provide a way for their sins to be cleansed, for them to be washed away, for the guilt of our past and all of the baggage that we bring, the ways we've, been, we've sinned and the ways we've been sinned against. God is going to bring uh, atonement, a covering, a washing, for sin for us. And we, and we flip over to chapter 2. Not only is this forgiveness going to be for Israel, but it's going to be for the nations. In chapter 2 we read, The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob, they may teach us his ways and may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears in a pruning hook. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. And so this, this law, this hope of Israel, is going to go out to the nations. A king is going to come who's going to bring God's peace to the world. We read it in Isaiah chapter 9. For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace. There will be no end. On the throne of David, over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth, forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Right? This is not a message of, you know, go pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, bring justice, bring morality to the, to the city of Grand Rapids. No, this is God and his zeal accomplishing what we could never do, establishing his king in Jerusalem to bring his peace to the nations. We flip over to chapter 11, we, we get back full circle to where I started out this morning here in chapter 11. There shall come a shoot from the stump of Jesse, Jesse being King David's father. There's going to be a king that's going to come and the spirit of the Lord is going to rest on him. Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what, he, what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with his rod of his mouth, and the breath of his lips shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his ways, and faithfulness the belt of his loins, and, and he's going to bring about an incredible harmony with the world. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the lion and the fatted calf together, and the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, the nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weak child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. The climax being that the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And so God's king is going to bring God's knowledge out to the nations. 
And people are going to experience what it is to be under the rule of a good king and to bring that good rule, bring his justice out to the nations. Establish his kingdom to the ends of the earth. And we long for that day. Right? When there are no more doubts about God's goodness, about God's love, about God's mercy, about God's plan. To be a day when we have a perfectly renewed relationship with God and the world is right and there's harmony between people and God and, and our relationships are restored and, and put back together. But before all of that can happen, God has to deal with the sin and the evil that mars his world and he's going to do it here in Isaiah through his servant. I want to I wanna close off in Isaiah here and this could go on for hours. There's so much so many riches to mine in the prophets. And I'm only scratching the surface. This could have easily been a 10 hour sermon here. But, but I want to close here and give you the vision of how God is going to reconcile the realities of this broken, fallen, jacked up world with this vision, with the hope that God has for his glory and his knowledge flowing the worlds of waters cover the sea. And he, Isaiah says this, who is believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he, this is, this is God's servant, grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not surely as borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity. I was all, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. And the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with many. And he will divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. And what we have encapsulated for us is the good news. Is it the hope that the prophets offered for people right, that can't even live up to our own standards, much less God's, that God is going to make a way, he's going to send his servant to bear sin, to take away iniquity. Ultimately, we're going to see to give his people a new heart, a heart that longs for him and for his people and for his kingdom to come here on earth as it is in heaven. God's going to radically transform the lives of his people through the servant. So while Israel had been restored to its land, they had built a little puny temple, they were still waiting for God to meet with his people. And while Israel thought these prophecies would all converge together in one great cataclysmic event at the end of the world, when the servant would come, forgive sins, and bring God's blessings out to the nations, what we see in hindsight is that there are actually two horizons in the prophets. If, you're, if you've ever been in a state where there are mountains, sometimes you look and you see this incredible mountain range. You look from Denver and you see the Rocky Mountains and you go, wow, it's one gigantic mountain. And then you, then you drive up and you're going skiing up there like I like to do. And as you get into the mountains, you realize there's peak upon peak upon peak going back further and further. And what we see in the prophets is that, is that there are two horizons. In the first horizon of these prophecies, Jesus is going to come. 
And he's going to be the suffering servant who bears the sins of many. He's going to be the one that would wash us white as snow. He's going to be the one that's going to transform our lives. He's going to make for himself a people right, whose lives are transformed, a people who long to live as his people in his world. And then he's going to come again a second time, not only to transform our lives, but to transform the world that we live in. And we live in between these two great comings of Christ. We live with the full riches of Jesus death for us on the cross, his love for us established. If you ever doubt God's love for you, have only a look back at the cross and to see the point in which God himself entered in to our suffering and our pain and our disillusionment. And he gave his life to win us back into his kingdom, to transform our lives, to give us a heart after his heart, and a heart to live for him. And that's how the prophets transform our lives. They point us to Jesus, who's going to give us the heart that we don't have to follow fully after him. To be a part of this movement where God's glory is going out to the extent in which God's glory is going to cover the earth as, as the waters ultimately cover the sea. And so, so Quan asked this earlier, and I'm going to ask it again. What are you, what are you putting your hope in? This morning. Right? The prophets are going to give one shining beacon of hope to the nations, and it's Jesus. Jesus is taking everything in this broken, fallen world, and he's, and he's putting it back together through Jesus, and he's, and he's starting with us. What's your hope? What are you looking towards? Is it a new relationship? Maybe a new job? A new school year? Some new toys that you're going to pick up? You know, what is it that you're putting your hope and your trust in when, when the bottom gets knocked out? What are you running to? What is it you find yourself looking? What do you medicate yourself with? Television, movie, media, work, relationships? You pick. What, what's your hope? But the prophets, they confront us with, with the judgment that, that in our hypocrisy, in our own power, we don't have what it takes to make it to God, but God, in his grace, stepped down into our world, intervened in the person of Jesus to give us new hope in life. And, and it's in light of that hope that we live. It's in light of that hope that full of God's spirit and made new creations in Jesus, right? We now get to walk out into the world as beacons of God's hope a fallen world. We get to take Jesus with us wherever we go, and because Jesus is now in us, through the Holy Spirit, we take Jesus with us, and we're the hope of the world wherever we go. And, and my dream for this church is that we would be a church that just radiates hope outwards into the city and outwards to the nations because we're people that have built our hope on Jesus Christ. People who find their place in God's story will settle for nothing less than God's the knowledge of the Lord to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and the prophets, God. Thank you for the hope, God. We thank you the way you, you call sin, sin, and you call hypocrisy out for what it is, but you offer an incredible hope. You offer Jesus rather than just sending judgment. You sent your son to take the punishment for our sins so that we could be transformed and that our world can be transformed. God, will we live in that? Will we be beacons of hope here in the city? Would you fill us with your Holy Spirit that we can walk out of that and live out of your hope in our world? We promise in Jesus' name.